First of all, good morning to everyone, and we're very happy to uh, have you and have the opportunity to speak with you today, and for hopefully for the next couple of weeks during the season of Lent. Uh, all of you who are seniors this year, you may remember last year I did the same thing with the seniors from the class of 2011, and this year for the class of 2012, I'm very happy to be able to speak with you, uh, just to encourage you in living your faith. And so part of the next couple of weeks will be a series of just things I'd like you to think about uh, as you're getting ready to move on in your life. And uh, so it's in that vein that we gather. It's in that vein that uh, I want you to know that I'm very concerned about you as you go forward. You know that you actually take seriously uh, the gift of life that God has given to you, the opportunity to be the people that God has called you to be. And so it's uh, in that vein that we would like to begin, as we do all things, we'd like to begin with the prayer. And the way this will work is I'm going to you know, begin with the sign of the cross, and now I'm going to uh, read a little scripture passage. Hopefully, as you listen to the scripture passage, we understand that in the Word of God, God speaks to us. And in this scripture passage, uh, I believe that God speaks especially to young people, you know, in the person of the young person, the rich young man who comes to Christ, uh, asking for some guidance and direction. And so let us begin together in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And this reading is taken from the Gospel of Luke. And a rich young man asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. And he said, All these I have observed from my youth. And when Jesus heard it, he said to him, One thing you still lack. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. But when he heard this, he became sad, for he was very rich. Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Just briefly as we reflect on the scripture reading we see that the Lord, the young man, came to Jesus looking for guidance. In real sense, he was looking for the meaning to life. And he obviously saw in Jesus someone who was different. And so he came to him to ask, you know, what do I have to do? What do I have to do for, to live forever? And, you know, he used the word good. And in that word good, Jesus comes back and says, why do you call me good? Only God is good. And it is that word good that I would like to focus on during the next couple of weeks with you. What does it mean to be good? And another way of saying that is, you know, this couple of weeks we'll talk about the idea of virtue. Good is related with virtue. What does it mean to be good? What does it mean to be the person that God has called me to be? God gives all of us different gifts to help us to develop our natural abilities that he has created us to have. God has made each one of us unique. He hasn't given all of us the same talents and same gifts. And that's important for us to understand. We don't all have the same talents and same gifts. But we all have gifts. And we all have talents. And the important thing that God asks us to do is not to so much look at a gift or talent that has been given to somebody else, but to see the gift and talent I have and to see how God wants me to develop that gift and talent and to use it. The first thing that God wants us to develop is the idea of virtue. virtue. And virtue is what develops in us when we actually use God's gifts, the way that he has established us to use them, the way that he wants us to use them. And in terms of our own being, God wants us to use our gifts in concert with who we are, who he has created us to be. You know, the catechism of the Catholic Church, it defines virtue. 
and it says that virtue is an habitual and firm disposition to do the good. It's a desire to do the good. And I would suggest to you that all of us really are made in that way. We, we like to do the good. Uh, sometimes when we look around and see evil, we may not think that. But I would say to you, even the most hardened criminal looks to do good. You know, my tenure here as Bishop of Harrisburg, I've had the opportunity to visit a number of prisons. You know, I've had the opportunity to visit the inmates who are in the prisons. And, you know, it's interesting. While they have made mistakes, you know, even in prison, there is a sense of goodness in them. They do strive to, to do the good. But so often they, you know, have failed in some reason. You know, but as I look at them, when I pray with them, you know, they're very open to the idea of that they should be doing better. And they're also open to the idea that they need God's help. And so this whole idea of virtue is important for us to realize that's what God has placed within us. Virtue really is the power within us that helps us to become the best possible me and the best possible you. That's what virtue is about. It's about, not about just simply doing good things. Virtue is about becoming truly who God made me to be, who God made me to be as a man and a woman. Okay? The, the word virtue itself comes, it's a word that comes from a Latin root, which is called vir, which means man. So, you know, sometimes as we look at different words, it helps us to understand a little better. The idea of man, right? Virtue have, means man, but what it really means is human being. It means a human being. What it means, a virtue means to be a human being. What's it mean to be truly a true human being? As Christians, you know, you and I, whenever we talk about being truly human, we need to talk about who is the perfect human being. And for you and I who believe in Jesus, we believe that Jesus is the perfect human being. We believe that Jesus is the Son of God. We believe that he's revealed to us that he came among us and he took on our human nature. For what purpose? To teach us, really, how to live our truly human life. The purpose of God becoming man is so that we can become God. God made us, and we're told this in Scripture in the beginning, God made all of us in his image and likeness. Now, sometimes it's hard for us to believe, but really when we look around the room here and look around our rooms and at the various schools, we should be looking. We're made in the image and likeness of God. So if we're saying, what does God look like? Look around. We're made in his image and likeness. And deep down, that's who he wants us to be. The Second Vatican Council teaches us that Jesus is the key to understanding the mystery of our humanity and the mystery of our human existence. When we want to see a picture of what a true, true human looks like, all we need to do, really, is to look at Jesus. And I would suggest to you that if we're truly human, that becomes attractive. Jesus obviously drew great people to him. There was something attractive about it. Was it the fact that he was God? Or was it the fact that he was living out truly his human nature as God intended our human nature to be lived? And if we live that truly, then that becomes attractive to people. If we truly live who we are, that becomes attractive. When we try to live like somebody else, you know, that's not, it doesn't work. When we accept who we are and we present ourselves as who we are, that becomes attractive to people because there's a sense of honesty and integrity about that. You see, Jesus reveals to every human being who they're called to be. So being truly human, what it really means is to me, means to be virtuous. If I'm truly human, I'm a virtuous person. If I'm truly living in accord with God's will for me as a human being, I'm a truly virtuous person. So it's simple. Being virtuous, virtuous means to be truly human, which means to be like Jesus himself. Now, you and I, when we usually talk about human, right, we usually use the word in a negative sense. Right, so often, how many, often we use the idea of human in a positive sense? We tend to use it, in, and what do I mean by that? Usually, we try to excuse our weakness by saying, well, I'm only human. You know, so often when we do something or make a mistake, we tend to excuse ourselves saying, well, well I'm not perfect, I'm only human, so it's all right to do that. You know, so we use human as a way to explain our weakness and our limitations. The reality is, <laughs> that's not what God wants. God doesn't accept that definition. 
God doesn't want us to use our humanity as an excuse for not developing and growing into the person that he wants us to be. And that's something for us to think about. You know, God doesn't want us to use our humanity as though that's something that is poor or inferior. You know, God loves us in our humanness. God loves us as human beings. And that's important for us always to understand. God doesn't look at us as though we're weak, poor, and in need. He loves us because he made us to be good, to be like him. You know, so what Jesus gives us, really, is a new definition for being human. Rather than being something that's negative, God wants that to be positive. He wants us to embrace our humanity, and he wants us to live it fully, but also in concert with the way God has created us, in concert with the way God has called us to be. You know, uh, human de- this definition of virtue challenges our common understanding. Okay, for us Christians, being human isn't about excusing weaknesses or making room for mistakes. It is truly about following Jesus Christ. And that's in the gospel that I read to you. That's what Jesus said to the young man. You know, you really want to f- get eternal life? You really want to be who you are? Give everything away. Follow me. Follow me. I'll teach you what it means to be fully human. Okay, so it's about pattering our life on the life of Jesus. The reason why he came is so we'd be able to see, you know, what it means to be a son and daughter of God. So this pattern for living needs to be rooted in what we call virtue, in good habits and good ways of thinking and in doing and saying, the things that are directed towards what is truly good, what is truly beautiful. Most of us are familiar, I don't know if you're around so much today, but you know, often a few years ago, you'd see people walking around with a T-shirt or with a, a necklace or with a, uh, a bracelet which said uh, WW. Uh, J.D. Remember that? So, and we know that that was not long ago, it was, it was, what would Jesus do? Right? And so you'd see people walk around, what would Jesus do? Yeah. Essentially, that question is asking, you know, what's the virtuous thing to be done? You know, people walk around and, what would Jesus do? It's, it's, what's the virtuous thing to be done? If we learn, like, how would Jesus approach this? And that's not a bad thing. Actually, it's a very good thing. Because Jesus is saying, how would Jesus approach this? You know, how would he be the truly human person? Uh, Whenever we are confronted with sometimes difficult things, we are forced to make a choice. You know, and we might ask, what would Jesus do in this situation? What's the right thing, the virtuous thing to do? I can tell you that so often in my, you know, people would write to me so often as a bishop when they're, they're upset about something. You know, they'll say to me, well, Jesus wouldn't do it that way. You know, so people do sort of look at, well, how would Jesus, they expect me really to respond in my life the way Jesus would respond. You know, and we must see that as all of us are called to respond that way. So virtue, but how does that happen? How do we become good? How do we uh, become the people we want to be? Well, a lot of it is in practice. You know, a lot of it is the idea of developing in us, repeating things and responding things in a way that is good. You know, the way we become good is by doing things that are good, and that becomes easier. Over time, you know, when we have to deal with situations, the answer to tough questions becomes easy, because what happens is we start to develop an attitude as to how we approach things. You know, in our life, we'll be confronted, you'll be confronted with many issues as you go forward. You know, and you're gonna have to make decisions. But hopefully, as you make good decisions as you go along, making decisions become easier. I would suggest to you that if you look at some of the top CEOs in the country, in the world, you know, how did they get to where they are? They were people who became comfortable making difficult decisions. Well, how did they achieve that skill? They achieved that skill by making good decisions. And people recognized that they made good decisions, and people started to follow them. And so the idea of making good decisions is important, and it's a skill that we have to develop. Now, how do you do that? You know, well, I'll give, you a, I'll give you a very simple example, but this maybe stretches a little bit, but let me tell you. For example, let's say now we have, uh, you know, Father Cawley here, you know, from York Catholic, and he gives tests periodically, right? And so perhaps we say that, uh, over, you know, Father Cawley has decided that he's going to give you an exam on Friday, okay? Now, you know this a week in advance, you know, I, I know that that happens, right? And so now, how do you approach that? You know, well, 
you have a choice. You know, do I study or don't I study, right? So what I may do, well, maybe Monday night, you know, you want to watch uh, Dancing with the Stars, right? Okay, and then Tuesday night, you really uh, tied them to Glee, you know, so you want to watch Glee, right? And so you say, well, I know I got an exam from Father Coley on Friday, but, you know, I won't study. It'd be fine, right? So I don't study. And so the week goes on, and there's another show on Wednesday, and I'm really going to get to this on Thursday, right? And so what happens, right? Each time, repeated choice, you don't study, right? Then all of a sudden, see, that's not really a virtue. That actually is what we call a vice, okay? Why? Because it's leading to an evil, right? What's the evil? Well, here's Friday. Here's the test. I don't have a clue on some of these things, right? So therefore, what has happened? Rather than living virtuously, I've I've flirted with evil, and it's come upon me, and here it is, right? But let's say I made a different decision. Let's say on Monday night, I said, okay, well, I can see Dancing with Stars many nights, so Monday night, I'm just going to pass it up this week because I got a test on Friday. And on Tuesday, I say, well, I'll let Glee go this week. I'll catch up on it next week. I'm sure it's not, I'm not going to lose too much. And then you continue to do that. What happened is, as you go through the week, you get more confident. You know the material. And then comes Friday, you're ready to go. You know, you're ready, you have the material, you're ready to go. Well, that's virtuous. The sense of now, now there's not an evil there, but it's a good. Because now you're anxious. Now you're willing to show, you know, that you've mastered the subject. Now you're willing to show what you've done. But how did that happen? Well, it came about by making good decisions. You know, saying, I, ne- I know this is coming. I need to be prepared and good things are happening. And what I'm saying to you is, in our decision-making process, you know, we have to look at what is the good? You know, how do I accomplish the goal I'm looking for? You know, how do I move towards the good? You see, and there's definite steps that you must take as you move forward. If I take other steps, it's not going to lead to the good. It's going to lead to something that is not helpful in the end. Okay? So I, I give you that little simple example. I know it limps a little bit. But I want you to just think about that because that comes true in the bigger questions of your life. You know, when you're asked to do things in the bigger question of your life, you have to make decisions. You know, especially now when you're going off to college. You know, you're going to get into a college. You're going to be meeting new friends. And, you know, the purpose of going to college, I hope that you understand that, is supposed to get an education, okay, not to party, okay? (laughs) But so often you find out that when you get to college, especially as freshmen, uh, everybody likes their new freedom. Right? And so they're going to use it new freedom. You know, and so often in, you're going to find the same thing in the, in the classroom. You're going to find as you go into a class, maybe it's Western civilization that you're taking, and all of a sudden the professor says to you, you know, here's 2,000 pages of reading, and uh, we're only having uh, two tests this uh, semester. One is going to be in October. The other one is going to be at the end of the semester. And here's the 2,000 pages. Now, he would give you advice and say, it'd be important for you to start to read that now. But I guarantee you, many freshmen, they like the idea that this weekend, uh, we're gonna have a party, we're gonna get a keg party, we're gonna do this and that. All of a sudden comes the middle of October, and now here's the first exam, and here's 2,000 pages, and about two nights before, we're gonna try and read 2,000 pages and put them together. You know, I'm just telling you that that's what happens. You know, what is the good decision to make? It would be prudent to say, the reason why I'm here, yes, I want to I wanna enjoy the college experience, but the purpose that I'm here is to make sure that I'm getting education for the fullness of life. And so you need to think about the bigger questions. You need to think about what you're doing, what your focus is, and how you're going to accomplish it. And really, that's what virtue is about. That's what it means about being a virtuous people, person. It means really thinking about what is my life about, you know, what, do I, what I want the future to be, and how am I going to get there. And it's not big decisions. Big decisions come about by making good little decisions. When you make good little decisions, you know, all of a sudden you get into a pattern, and then you're focused on making the challenging, difficult decisions. And so I want to encourage you to understand that. Virtue is a critical aspect in the development of your character and your identity. You know, one of the things that we must be focused on, you know, you and I as human beings is, you know, what is our character? Who are we? You know, what type of person am I? Am I a trustworthy person? Am I a loyal person? Am I a compassionate person? 
when somebody sees me, you know, if they want to be friends with me, what type of person do they see? Do they see somebody who is a, a, a fair weather friend? Or do they see somebody who's going to be with them through thick and through thin? Is there somebody that really, what type of character? We have to develop the type of character that we're going to be. You know, we have to be known. So often there used to be a thing years ago, which I think unfortunately in society today is not as, as true, it used to be your word is your bond. Your word is your bond. There used to be a, used to be a phrase that says like, you know, if I give my word, you can bank on it. You know, we live in a society today, unfortunately, but that's not always the case. You know, unfortunately, I think so often, you know, that's uh, many times people give their word and don't follow through. And you and I perhaps have been a recipient of that from periodic time. When somebody says they're gonna do something and they don't do it, and it becomes hurtful to us. You know, so, you know, the idea of being a virtuous person is developing a character. You know, who do you, how do you wanna be known? You know, and this is important for each of us to take seriously. You know, do you wanna be your own person? Do you wanna be accepted for who you are? Or are you gonna try your life to live your life based upon what other people think you should be? You know, if you try to live your life based upon what other people think you're going to be, you're going to lose your identity. You're going to lose who you are. After a while, you're not even going to know who you are. I, use this, I used to use this little phrase. It's sort of like the idea of being a truthful person. You know, once we start to lie, we start on a very slippery slope. And we know that it's not good, and we know eventually sometimes we'll lose our identity. What do I mean by that? Well, for example, you know, suppose there's a group of us and we're friends, right? And... Uh, Tonight, you know, we're going to go to uh, the movies. But perhaps uh, the three of us decide that, uh, well, we don't want to invite Jim. You know, Jim, you know, he's sort of awkward, Jim. Uh, you know, he's a nice guy to hang around, but we don't want him to go here. So what happens is we're together, and Jim says, what are we going to do tonight? Nothing. You guys doing anything tonight? No, we're not doing anything tonight. Right? So we agree we're not going to tell Jim. Right? So Jim doesn't do anything. The next day, we call up with Jim. What did you guys do last night? Well, we knew we, we lied the night before, but there's something inside us that knows that's not right. Next day we see Jim, he says, oh, you know, oh, what did you guys do last night? Uh, really didn't do anything. We have to lie again. You know, and then we have to keep telling other people lies so that uh, Jim doesn't find out that we lied to him. You know, eventually, I, don't long, I no longer know what is true or what's not true because I've told so many lies, I'm not exactly sure what is the truth anymore. You know, so, you know, being a virtuous person is making a decision, you know, in terms of how am I going to focus towards the good so I can be the person that God calls me to be. You know, a lot of times we need examples, you know, examples of who are good people and who are virtuous people. I would like to suggest to you one people that is a virtuous person that all of us have experienced is uh, blessed Pope John Paul II. You know, all the saints of the church celebrate as an example of men and women you know, who have lived virtuous lives. Sometimes they went to a heroic lens to be consistent in the way they lived their life and their faith in the world. You know, you have a situation like a Maximilian Kolbe. You know, Maximilian Kolbe was a man who was a Franciscan priest who gave his life up for a Jewish man in the concentration camps. How did he have the ability to do that? How could he do that? How was he willing to give that up? Well, I would suggest to you that, you know, he had lived a virtuous life his whole life and he saw a greater good. And so therefore he always went to the good. And he felt it was better for this Jewish man who had a family to be able to survive the concentration camp than for him who had committed himself to God and was really looking forward to coming to the kingdom. And so he gave himself up. You know, uh, and as I said, John Paul II, you know, he's a man, I'd say, he's a great man of virtue and a great model for you as young people. Why do I say that? Because he's a person who really embraced life. I had the privilege of meeting John Paul II many times. Uh, when I was a priest, I was the secretary of a Cardinal Kroll. He was, a young, he was a young pope. That was the first time I met him. And I've been in his company many, many times. I traveled different places with him. When he went to the United States a couple times, when he was in California, when he was in uh, New York and Boston, I had the privilege of being with him and watching the crowds attracted to him. And I also had the opportunity to speak with him many times. You know, and the question is, what, what made him you know, the person he was. What made him attractive to so many people? He was a very natural person. He loved life. You know, uh, it's not so much that he performed miracles, right? Over time, you know, what he did was he lived his life to his fullest. He embraced human life, but he tried to live it in according with God's will. Uh, 
you know, one of the things he did, as you look at his biography, and you look at his life, uh, he was a, an actor, he was a playwright, uh, he was a great athlete, you know, uh, he loved to get together, he was a scholar, intellectual, and he loved to be with people, and he loved to talk to them about what was good and what was true. You know, and John Paul II, you know, when people saw him, they had a connection with him. There was something about him. He was very warm and very embracing. You know, I'll tell you the first time I met him, which was sort of an interesting story, I, I just remained the secretary of Ricardo Prol, and I'd never been to Rome. We went to Rome, and, uh, you know, the, it was a, on a Wednesday, which is a Wednesday audience. And when I went to the Cardinal, we went into the Vatican. I'd never been there before. And we went to St. Peter's Basilica, which used Basilica, but nobody was in there on Wednesday morning because the audience was outside. And I was just enthralled by the whole experience of just being in the Vatican and being in the Basilica. And when the, the Cardinal said to me, let's go outside for the audience, the Pope is coming, we walked out the doors of St. Peter into the square, and there were 10,000 people there. And I was just floored. And I said, oh my goodness, look at this. You know, and we walked down, and the Cardinal told me, you know, just sit behind me, the Pope is coming. So when Pope John and Paul II came into the square, everybody went crazy. And then he came up, and he sat down, and he gave a, his talk on the Wednesday audience. After the audience, he came down to greet the cardinals, and the cardinal said to me, get at the end of the line. So I did, I got at the end of the line, and as he comes down, he gets to me, and here I am with all these cardinals, and he looks at me, and the cardinal Kroll stepped up and said, your holiness, this is my new secretary, Father McFadden. And he looked at me and said, you are very young to be secretary. <laughs> and I said, and the cardinal then stepped in, because I wasn't that young at that time. I was a little later in the vocation. The cardinal stepped in and said, oh, he's not that young. And then the Holy Father looked and pointed at the cardinal and said, you have a very tough boss. You know? But it was a very human exchange. You, know, you would think that somebody with this authority, it was a very human exchange. I also tell the other story. One time I had the opportunity to go and have lunch with them you know, in the Vatican. And it was after the cardinal had been sick. We went up, and it was a, a Sunday. We went up into his uh, apartment, and it was uh, the cardinal and myself and this other Polish bishop. And what happened is the Holy Father came into the parlor. It was a Sunday, and I st we stood up to greet him. And he said, wait, wait a minute. He says, uh, we have to do the angels. So he went to the window in the Vatican, and they threw open the window, and that's where he gives his Sunday angels. So we were on the inside looking out. And so he gave, in the square, there was about 5,000 people. So he spoke with them, and after he spoke with them, he came back in to the room. And then... He, the, he greeted the cardinal and greeted the Polish bishop, and then he came to me. And I said, Your Holiness, thank you for inviting me for lunch. So he said to me, he said, Father, and he used to call me Makfaden. He said, Father Makfaden, he said, uh, do you speak Polish? And I said, oh, no, Your Holiness. And he said, do you speak Italian? And I said, well, Your Holiness, I said, I you know, make my way in Italian, but I said, I wouldn't say I'm fluent in Italian. So he said, what language do you speak? I said, well, I speak English. You know, and so... He said, okay, so well, at lunch we're going to speak in Polish. But he said, don't worry. So we went into the dining room, and he sat here, and he had the, the cardinal sit across from him, and then he said, Father Makfaden, you sit next to me. And so I sat next to him. And the interesting thing was, they started talking Polish. But about every two or three minutes, he would turn to me and translate into English what they said. And he'd say, do you want to add anything? I'd say, oh, no, you're holding just happy to be here. You know? But the sensitivity, the sensitivity, you know, of being, making sure that everybody was included, you know. And I would suggest to you that that was sort of the Pope's dynamism. He was a truly human person. He really enjoyed being with people, you know. Also, his ability to forgive. Now, most of us are familiar, you know, with the story of he was shot. You know, when, in 1981, you know, he was shot in St. Peter's Square, you know, by a man. And one of the interesting things that the media caught was that this, the Holy Father, you know, after he recovered from his uh, injuries, which were very devastating, in actuality, he probably should have died. Nobody, the doctors were amazed that he actually survived that surgery because he was shot at blank range in the stomach, which blew apart his insides. And it took them a great deal of time just to repair it. You know, and when you think about it, that was in 1981, and he lived until 2004, you know, but he always attributed that to the intercession of Blessed Mother. But the interesting thing was, after he recovered, the first thing he wanted to do was to go to the prison, to meet the man who shot him, to be able to 
tell him he forgives him and to embrace him. You know, uh, for most of us, you know, if we're injured, a lot of times we want to strike back. But the Holy Father understood that the Lord calls us to forgive. And so Pope John Paul II, you know, had the ability to forgive others. And how was he able to do that? Well, he had practiced that. He had practiced doing that many times. Well, how do you know that? Well, I know another story about John Paul II. When he was uh, in Poland, uh, he was a priest. He used to teach classes like I do here. But the communist government used to watch him. They thought he was sub a subversive. And they didn't trust him. And so what they did was they planted a young person to be a spy in his class to see if they could catch him doing something subversive. And this young person would take notes and listen and report back to the communist government. One time he came to Pope John Paul II for confession. And they wanted to see what he was going to say to him in confession. And so the young man went to confession to John Paul II and then went back and told the authorities what John Paul II had said in confession. Finally, the young man realized that this was wrong. And he went to John Paul II and told him he was a spy and that he was sat sorry for what he did. And John Paul II says, I forgive you. Don't worry about that. We all make mistakes. You know, but we have to just move on, move forward. The ability to forgive, you know, rather than deceive, the ability to forgive and to move on. You know, last night, you know, I had the opportunity to watch uh, a little show on the Amish. You know, it was on the public broadcasting system. And I found it very fascinating. We talk about virtue. Now, of course, we know that they're a little bit different than Catholics. But one of the things I was fascinated by, they told the story about how a number of years ago, you know, in a schoolhouse there in Lancaster, you know, a, a guy went in and killed a number of the kids there. The interesting thing was the Amish people, you know, the night of the killing, you know, some of the Amish community went to the house of the family of the man who did the shooting to forgive them. As a matter of fact, some of the parents whose children died in, the, in that shooting went to that man's funeral. And it was sort of interesting, how could they do that? And what they said was, you know, uh, we give you forgiveness because forgiveness is up to God. It's up to God to, to make judge. We don't judge, we forgive. And they said it was a freeing experience. You know, why do I tell you these things? Because, you know, that's what virtue is about. It's about being a person always looking for goodness. You know, it's about being, defining my life by goodness. And if we do that, it becomes attractive to people. The saints are attracted to people because of their goodness. You know, I had the opportunity also to meet, like, Mother Teresa. You know, Mother Teresa was, a, everybody knows, is acclaimed a, a as saint. You know, why? Because of her goodness. But what was it that made her good? It started with something very simple. When she came out of her house in Calcutta, she saw a man on the street who was homeless and who was dying. And her compassion and love for him moved her to lift him up, to bring him into her house, and to wash him off, and to feed him, and prepare him for death. And she started to do that over and over again. And all of a sudden, Mother Teresa is renowned around the world for her goodness. You know, why was it? She based her life upon what it means to be truly human. I would suggest to you, when we look at these saints, they're not oddities. That's who God wants us to be. He wants us to be truly human. You know, and when we come in touch with our humanity and live our life as God calls us, then we become truly human. And so at this point, I probably have put most of you to sleep. But uh, uh, it's nice to be with you. I, I'd like to uh, you know, take the opportunity now maybe just to uh, give you a chance to ask a few questions. But the bottom line is we're called to be virtuous people. You know, and as you go forward in your life, I just want to encourage you. you know, realize how God has put goodness within you and always look to do the good. And if you do that, you'll find that, you know, you will enjoy life, you'll have peace in life, and it'll be a very good life. Anyway, uh, do we have any questions, or shall I give you a chance to just relax and stretch? <laughs> I'll tell you what, if you have a question, if you just go, uh, and the, those who are in the other schools, maybe we should just go to different schools. Uh, if you have a question, just go to the mic, and uh, you may ask a question, and we'll try to respond to it. Anybody here in the auditorium has a question, uh, please do that. The Church of Silence. <laughs> <laughs>
And for those uh, remote, if you have, just identify the school that you're from, if you have a question. No questions. <laughs> Father Coley has a question. <laughs> Father Coley is here with York Catholic here in the Diocesan Center. Bishop, we're just getting started in district basketball play hmm. around the state. Uh, the Fighting Irish of York Catholic High School play tonight. The girls do, and tomorrow the boys do. The backwards, yeah. the boys are tonight, the Giants Center. And the girls are tomorrow night. They've worked hard to get where they are, as other teams have. All teams have, I'm sure. You talked about being good. Would you say a bit about what it means to be good at something and what that means more deeply, though, to be good? I know you were a basketball coach and a basketball player. What did it mean to be good at basketball, to be good at coaching, to have good teams? And then what does it mean to be good? good. Uh, for those who could not hear the question, I'll, I'll re repeat it. Father Coley was saying that... Uh, York Catholic has uh, district playoffs coming up, and the girls and the boys are in that, the boys tonight and the girls tomorrow. And uh, so Father Coley was asking about the idea of the use of good. He knows that I was a basketball coach at one time, and he asked a little bit deeper idea of what does it mean to be good and what is just uh, the deeper understanding of good. Well, from a basketball standpoint, you know, I would say the idea of good is always striving for excellence. Try to be the best you can possibly be. I used to, when I was a coach, I used to say to our players, I don't expect everybody to be a great shooter, but I expect everybody to be the best shooter they can possibly be. I don't expect everybody to be able to handle the ball like a, a wizard, but I expect them to take that talent and to be the best that they can possibly be at that. You know, what does it mean to be good? It means to strive to use our gifts and talents to develop them to the best possible level that I have the capacity of doing that. You know, and that is what the deepness of goodness is, to try to develop myself to be the best possible person that I can be so that, therefore, I can fulfill my potential. God has placed within us a potential. He's put, uh, put in each one of us a potential to do different things. And as I mentioned at the beginning, we have different gifts and talents. So I would always say to my players, my athletes, you know, as a team, you know, it's not a matter whether we win or lose. If we strive for excellence, if we strive to be the best that I can possibly be, then the score really doesn't matter because I've accomplished my goal. You know, there used to be a John Wooden who was a great coach of UCLA basketball, and he had a thing called a pyramid of success. And his whole thing on that pyramid of success was, his definition of success was, you know, trying to be the best person or the best, do the best I could to become the best I was capable of becoming. The idea was always trying to be the best uh, that I could be based upon the talent and skill that I have. And so that's, uh, well, thanks for the question. I've Lancaster Catholic. What is your name? Good morning, Bishop. Good morning, what uh, is your name? name? Is Peter from, uh, my name is Peter Favell from Lancaster Catholic High School. Uh, first off, my friend Jacob wants to say hi, personally. And also, Good. Uh, Thanks, like Jacob. To say, Hello uh, to you. <laughs> uh, this Sunday, you gave a letter out to all the churches considering the Obama's administration's attack on religious freedoms uh, on the organizations run such as Catholic Charities and Catholic Hospitals. I'd like to hear from you personally how, as leader of the diocese, you would like to rally us as Catholics to block this legislation and how, as young people, we can share a part in this attempt. Peter, that's a great question. It is, it is a definite... Yes, thank you. Thank you. And I, we do have to rally. You know, the letter that I had read at all the masses dealt with a tremendous challenge to what is one of the foundational principles of our country, the challenge to religious liberty. Uh, the Obama administration has put into place these, this health care law, and he put regulations in there, first of all, which would define what it means to be a religion. Our Constitution, the First Amendment of the Constitution, does not define religion. It only says that the government should not establish a religion nor prohibit the free exercise thereof. One of the challenges in its regulations is, first of all, they have decided to define religion and the freedom of religion, not as freedom of religion, but as freedom of worship. They've made an exception for people who 
uh, only cater to people of their same faith, only uh, belong, are only proselytizing, and it's not about the idea of exercising my right to live my values out in society. And so that's the challenge. The second thing is that it's the first time the government is forcing us to go against our conscience. You know, part of us, we know that the church believes in the sacredness of human life. The media would have us believe that this is about contraception and artificial contraception. It's not about that. While we don't believe in artificial contraception, what we say is you cannot force us to make, to provide that for other people, nor to provide services that destroy life, such as abortifacient drugs that destroy children. And so we need you as young people. You are inheriting this country. Right now, many of you are coming to be 18. You're adults in this country. You know, it's your country. You know, what happens is you've got to rally around and demand from the government that they respect the principles upon which this government was founded. We are a constitutional government, the co- a government of laws, and that right to religious freedom is very sacred in this country. Men and women have died, you know, to save that right. And so all of us have to make our voices heard. And what should you do? I would hope that all of you in your senior class, you get together, you'd send letters to Senator Casey and to your representatives saying that you're the future of this country and you do not want anybody to violate the principle of the free exercise of religion. And you ask him to put that into law. And also, I think you've got to speak to your, uh, your contemporaries and tell them that they have to make their voices heard. This is how democracy works in this country. You know, uh, I use an analogy this way. If you let this happen, we don't know what happens down the line. For example, you know, okay, it's you've got to provide this type of service. You know, a year from now, they may decide that, you know, older people are too much of a burden on society. So my mother, who's 88, you know, it costs a lot for her heart medicine, and she's only going to die anyway. So from now on, we're not going to allow you to provide that medicine, but we'll give you a nice little pill that if she takes it, she can sleep away tonight. Can the government do that? Well, see, with this put into place, you're giving the government the right to establish those things. We have to fight that. So, Peter, thank you for the question. Does it, that answer you? Yes, Bishop. Thank you very much. Good. Thanks. Any other questions? Yes, please. Just say what your name is, okay? Um, hello, Bishop. I'm Haley Warner from York Catholic. Going back to the scriptures in which it talked about selling your possessions to follow Christ, I was challenged by this just a few years ago and tried to enact it, which my parents were not so thrilled about. How can we enact this while still focusing on our studies and what we're you know, striving to be our best at in college life, past high school. Okay. What's your first name again? Haley. Haley? Haley Warner. Hazy. Hazy, thank you for your question. Hazy's question, I'm sorry, is it Hazy? I hope it's right. Her question was, you know, she tried, I began the, this, this uh, session with the reading of scripture about, you know, selling all your possessions and following Jesus. And she said that she tried to do that, you know, became a little bit difficult. You know, so uh, how do we do that? Well, actually, the issue really is about selling possessions. What the Lord is really saying there is that, that we don't become attached to something. Okay? He's not saying you know, to make yourself poor okay? in the sense of uh, materially poor in the sense of the world. What he's saying is that do not allow possessions and material things to be the focus of your life and to capture you. We live in a material society where I need things. What the Lord is saying is, when he says, sell what you have, he's really talking about the idea of don't become so attached to things that you fail to be attached to the most important thing, which is God. You know, don't attach your life to uh, particular uh, material possessions. For example, to making yourself wealthy, you know, to uh, having particular things where your whole focus is on getting things. What the Lord is saying is, the focus of our life should be basically on relationship. It should be upon, you know, my relationship with others. 
and not on amassing wealth and amassing possessions. And that was what he was addressing with the rich young man. The rich young man, we're told in the scriptures, had many possessions. And he was focused on his possessions. But he was missing, really, the opportunity to be involved with other people. He was missing the opportunity to engage other people in relationship. You know, what our Lord calls us to be is to be in relationship. You know, to look around and to realize that our treasure is each other. That our treasure, for example, in your family, you know, if you grow and you're married, your treasure is your children. Not how many cars you have. Not how big your bank account is. Your treasure is the young people in front of you. They're your brothers and sisters. They're your children. That's where your value is. And so it's not a matter of having to have things for them. It's a matter of appreciating them and enjoying them. Okay, so uh, as you go forward, that's the challenge. You know, the, God made everything, you know, and things are good. But he doesn't want us to be attached to things. He wants us to be attached to one another, you know, to support one another, encourage one another. And so the idea of selling what I have and giving to the poor is really the idea of the Lord is saying, don't get attached to things of this world. This world is passing. Attach yourself to things that have meaning. And what is that? First of all, to God, who is our Father who calls us to life, but also our brothers and sisters. You know, be a good friend. You know, be a supportive friend. See the good in others. Encourage people to be the best. And encourage people to be honest in their relationships. And that is what the Lord is asking. Is that helpful? Yes. Good. Thank Thanks. you. Any other questions about this or other things? Shall we, Sister Aska? We're looking somewhere here. Where is Trinity at? It's up in the corner? Nobody from Trinity has any questions? Huh? Go ahead. We just we just lost Trinity. <laughs> okay. Good. Go ahead. I'm Mark Connolly from Trinity High School. What question do you have? Um, we were wondering what you personally uh, are doing for Lent. That's a great question. Uh, thank you for that question. Here's my focus for Lent. Uh, my focus for Lent really is to take a little more time, okay, to pray my chapel uh, in the mornings, okay, and uh, it's just sort of, and I'm praying for, you know, the people in the Diocese of Harrisburg that they may grow in their love for Jesus. The other thing I've committed myself to do is once a week I'm going to do something for the poor, and I'm looking around for opportunities, whether it is to provide some additional money from my own expenses to do something for the poor or to go out and to visit somebody and uh, see if I can help them out in some way. So every week during Lent, uh, I'm going to do something for the poor. And uh, in that way, I'm trying to grow a little bit more uh, like the Lord. And so there are my resolves. I mean, I do other things for Lent. Like, for example, uh, I fast every day. So what that means is I only eat three meals a day and of three meals... Only one meal is a big meal. The rest of the day I don't eat, you know. And uh, so I try to do some fasting, you know, do a little bit more praying. But my big focus to this uh, Lent is uh, trying to figure out something I can do for poor people, you know. And so I'm looking around for opportunities. You know, last week I had the opportunity, you know, to send money uh, to a family uh, who's, uh, they were in arrears of tuition at one of our Catholic schools, you know, and they sent me a letter and said they were going to have to leave the school because they couldn't afford to go. So I sent them a check, you know, to pay for that out of my own, own money. So that's, uh, those are the type of things I do. Thank you, Bishop. Good. Could I ask you, could I, could I ask you, what are you doing for life? <laughs> such as like drinking soda and eating between meals. <laughs> yeah, okay, good. 
Well, thank you. <laughs> How about, uh, do we have Lebanon Catholic? Are they on the... No, Lebanon had... Oh, Lebanon had trouble. Yeah. Who do we hear from? Delone Catholic. What, are they hiding? They're in the bottom. Yeah. Nobody from Delone has any questions? Remember, there's there's no dumb questions in this. <laughs> Can you see me? Yeah, you're good. You just look straight up at the screen. Don't look. Uh, hi, Bishop McFadden. My name is Jack from Duane Catholic. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Jack. It's nice to see you today. Nice to see you as well. Um, uh, this is our senior class here from Duane uh, listening in to you today. And we were just wondering, with uh, the changes in the economy and everything and uh, rising gas prices, if you had any advice for our class as uh, we enter adulthood within the next couple of years, anything that you would have us do economically that would uh, benefit us as we grow older? That's a good question, Jack. And one of the challenges, because it is, I mean, to be honest with you, I, my belief is that uh, things are not going to get easier in the, in the near term, you know. And so I do think what we have to do is we have to look at how we're living our lifestyle, what is important, you know, and even in terms of, you know, frugal use of gasoline, uh, in the sense of it's going to be very difficult, we're going to have to make some decisions, you know, and perhaps uh, I'm going to have to start to, you know, think in doing terms of things that are maybe not as ex- expensive, that are not going to cost as much money. Just getting together, for example, to, you know, uh, play a game together or do different things together rather than going places and spending money, you know, to enjoy each other's company, you know, and to be together and to, you know, perhaps learn uh, talents and things that people can share with each other. Uh, we have to start to look at and realize that we cannot live in an economy where money is unlimited. It's not unlimited. And we have to be frugal in terms of what we can do. We waste a lot of money, you know, and we do things a lot of times. The, we live in a society where the media tries to get us the impression that we can't live without certain things. The reality is we can live without a lot of things. You know, we've done that before. So my advice is, when you're dealing with your economy, with your finances, you know, make decisions based upon something that will have value, not just for a momentary thing, but in the long run. And also start to cultivate activities that you can do that is fun together that a lot of times doesn't require money. You know, for example, I'll give you an example. I used to be a high school president, you know, and uh, the high school I was at. And I used to encourage our young people, you know, we had things like, you know, I started something called a game night, okay? And what I did was I just got all sorts of games from years ago, and we set them up in the, uh, in the auditorium, and we had people come in and just uh, play, play games and learn different games. And then uh, towards the end of the night, we then ran a competition for those games, you know, and some of them were just uh, stupid games, like they may be Connect Four or made different things, but we'd set them up around the, the gym, and it's just an opportunity of coming together and just having fun. You know, the same type of thing, like, for example, uh, you know, getting together and saying, okay, we're going to have a volleyball tournament in school uh, on a Friday night. Everybody's invited. It doesn't cost anything. We just show up. You know, you can bring your own teams, you know, and we play some music, and we just be together and enjoy playing volleyball, or we're going to have a dodgeball tournament, or, you know, we're going to have a Dancing with the Stars. You know, we're going to have, to, you know, everybody just grab a partner, and, you know, this night we're just going to have a, a little competition. We'll come for a thing. It's, you know, it's not going to cost anything. We get DJ, just, you know, we'll come together, and then we'll have a competition, and, you know, you can grab a partner, and those type of things. I think there's lots you can do without having to spend money, you know, and putting money in a, in a car that's going to have to take you great distances that's going to kill you there. Does that help? Thank you. Thank you, Bishop. That was very enlightening. I appreciate it. Okay, you're welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Jack. Good. Okay. One more. Okay, we got two. Hi, how you doing? I'm doing great. What's your name? My name's Stormy. Good. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I know. I know that a lot of us here, and I'm sure everyone else, are dealing with a lot of changes. Whether it's our friends or issues that we're dealing with with boyfriends, girlfriends, friends, parents. Um, what is it that um, 
Because I know a lot of us are going off to school and a lot of us are trying to figure out what's going to be worth it all and what is um, we're going to benefit if we continue with the things that we're going through and continue with the things that we want to do for ourselves. Um, what do you think is important for us to focus on while we make, go through all these changes and while we accept the things in our lives that we can't change and all that? What do you think is important for us to focus on while we go through all those things? The first, that's a good question. The first thing that I think you have to uh, focus on is, first of all, to realize that you're a valued person, to realize, to have a deep love for yourself because God loves you. And so, and to not be afraid to be who you are and to not be afraid and do not live your life based upon the expectations of wanting to impress other people. You know, we can't change. We are who we are. We have strong points. We have weak points. You know, uh, Bishop McFadden's not perfect. Not everybody loves Bishop McFadden. Maybe hard to believe, but it's, not, it's true. You know, not everybody loves... And, but I can't live my life based upon wanting everybody to love me. You know, I am who I am. I try to be true to myself. You know, and I listen to people. You know, and realize that there's certain people in your life that God has placed there that really love you as well. You know, and one of the challenges as we grow and develop, God's given us the gift of our parents. You know, now our parents, there's nobody who loves us more than our parents. You know, it's important for us to understand, we're their flesh and blood. And, you know, when they try to guide us, it's not because they want to make life miserable for us. They want us to protect us, you know, because they love us. And they don't want us to go the wrong direction. And so we have to listen to what they're saying. But we also realize that God made us, you know, to grow, we, we, to be independent. You know, so one of the tensions that we experience, that you're experiencing right now, is as we grow and get older, we want to be independent a little bit, you know. And so the way to do that is not by going against parents, but by trying to have a conversation and to, in a, in a calm way, and ask them why they feel what they feel. And then to explain basically why you feel what your position is. And then to sometimes, a lot of times, you can come to a medium ground because your parents do love you. They don't want, they don't want to make life difficult for you. They want to support you. So a lot of times if there's something you don't disagree with, the best way to do it is rather than just violate it, you know, be honest and say, Mom or Dad, I, I, really, I really don't understand why I can't do this. And, and listen. You know, and if they, they can articulate a lot of times why they feel the way they do. But then have a discussion as to why you think it should be the other way. But always go towards the good. You know, a lot of times, you know, we realize sometimes what is good, but we, we're attracted, unfortunately, in our society, sometimes we're attracted towards evil. You know, and sometimes the devil can make us think that something that is evil is good. We see that so often in our society. You know, people tend to, the devil tends to make people think, oh, this will really make you happy. This will really be what you want. And when we go there, we find out it really didn't make us happy. Maybe for a short time it did. I would suggest to you that many in our society who are caught in the addictions of drugs and alcohol, they went in that direction because they thought that was going to, you know, make them happy and good. Uh, I would suggest to you is look at those people down the line. They're neither happy nor is it good. It's bad. You know, so you have to evaluate those things. What is going to bring you true happiness? What I suggest brings you true happiness is, first of all, you know, living in according to the way of the values of our Judeo-Christian faith. Jesus teaches us what it means to be the truly human and good person. You know, he doesn't give us, he doesn't teach us things because he wants to make life miserable for us. He's made us in such a way that we'll find our joy and happiness when we actually live in concert with the way he believes. And so, you know, it starts with respect for yourself. You know, you have to value yourself. And uh, don't let anybody dis- disvalue. And especially, you know, in the sense of in relationships. You know, people will tend to use you. You know, so we have to be discerning. Does this person really appreciate me for who I am? Or is this person using me? You know, and that's a very difficult thing to judge. The only way you can judge it is by testing. You know, you test. You know, is this person a friend in good times and bad times? Is this person only want to be around me when things are good? You know, is this person leading me in a path that is going to be fulfilling for me? Does the person respect my opinion over against their opinion? Or am I expected always to follow along? If I want to do something different, am I, do they never come my way? I always got to go their way? 
if those are things that are happening, then I would suggest to you, be cautious. So my you know, advice to you as you go forward is listen to those who love you. You know, your parents, your teachers. Find, try to find good friends. The one thing I would say to you is, in life, it's very difficult to find good friends. There's an old adage, in life you'll make many acquaintances, but you'll find few friends. Why? Because so often people want to be an acquaintance of ours, but they're really not looking out for our own good. And if you find a true friend, as the scripture tells you, you found a pearl of great price. If you find somebody who is going to be with you through thick and thin, and who's going to be there with you, you know, no matter what happens, you have a great treasure. And that's something that we should always be looking for. You know, look for good friends, you know, test the waters, you know, and see who's going to be there. And especially now as you go into college, you know, or you're going on to a different aspect of your life, you're going to have to be, be making friends. Evaluate how you make friends. You know, evaluate what type of friend do you want. And it starts with being, what type of friend are you? And I would suggest to you that, you know, the friends that you'll have will really reflect the type of friend that you are. If you're a person that looks for the good in the other, who's not afraid to challenge somebody when they're going the wrong way, that are going to be hurtful to themselves, then I would suggest then you'll find good friends. Okay? Thanks All for right, the question. Sounds good. Good. Yep. good. Well, sister, I think we come to the end of the time here. Okay, well, again, uh, thanks for being with us this morning. I'll let you go. Uh, we look forward to seeing you in the next couple of weeks. And uh, hopefully, uh, you know, we'll have different people here in uh, the Dyson Center. As I said, your Catholic is here in front of me. So uh, we thank them for coming to be with us. And uh, we'll see you from remotely next week. But uh, this week we're here with you. So God bless.